everyone yeah so we have about 30 minutes yeah. uh, short cut short from 40 minutes because apparently we were we don't have enough insights to share <laughs> shall we start with a quick introduction yeah. from you Hari? okay uh, good morning everyone I'm Hari I had the data engineering in uh, income income is a insurance company and my team is uh, mainly focusing on setting up the data platform, the engineering, the data ecosystems. So we have, our focus is to make sure we have the platforms ready for the data scientists, for the business users to leverage and run use cases on top of the platforms. And how do we ensure that we give a platform that is scalable, secure? Also, I think working with the different challenges of data that we have in today's world. Looking forward to an insightful session with my fellow panelists here today. Hello, everyone. My name is Andreas. I'm currently the global head of digital transformation of Alpha Gamma Group. Alpha Gamma Group is an industrial manufacturing company, very traditional, has actually nothing to do with digitalization. And what we are now doing is we are starting the digital transformation journey from scratch. So we really started with nothing. And right now what we did, we set up um, a global team responsible for driving the digital transformation. Here we talk about from the basics of data management, starting structuring the data up until using artificial intelligence to provide business solutions to our customers, uh, but also to our internal organization. So really the whole transformation journey end to end. And as uh, my pre uh, successor, I'm uh, of course excited to join the panel discussion. Thanks, Andreas. Hello, everyone. I am Akash Koel. I'm working as the head of data engineering for GoTo Financial, and we are building uh, data products in GoTo Financial for making a scalable, self-serve data platform. In the past, I've been fortunate enough to work in different domains, starting from healthcare, uh, banking, fintech, e-commerce. And, and yeah, I believe that uh, we have not leveraged the power of data, which is just a journey that we have begun right now. So I think it starts here as well. So I'm looking forward to this session, excited to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. And me, you already know, uh, I am Milind uh, with uh, presently as uh, product owner, data science for working for Mercedes-Benz, uh, looking after region overseas. And I have strong views on digital transformation journeys. And so, perfect, let's start. So Akash, uh, yeah, uh, if I may ask, since uh, your organization is now in early stages of its uh, journey, yeah, with all the developments that you've seen around AI, data, data science, yeah, what are the business challenges that you see uh, in, you, in your industry yeah, uh, that you would like your organization to help prepare for? Sure, uh, it's a great question. So. If, if I think about my company, right, or even any company, the biggest challenge I see at the moment is how do we link our data strategy to business strategy, irrespective of any development which is happening in any technology. The biggest challenge we see that whatever we do with data, it sometimes becomes very difficult to uh, give a quantifiable business impact of that initiative and how it is going to impact your business. As an example, can I say that we did something in data with this initiative, but be able to drive the revenue? It becomes very tough because of the number of uh, uh, intermediaries involved in the process. So if we have to leverage the power of data, unless we start understanding the business impact it is created, creating, we won't be able to uh, uh, create new initiatives and, and drive it. And, and with AI coming up, I see there are many more opportunities and hopefully we will talk more about it. Uh, that's my answer. Thank you, Akash. How about you, Andy? Well, my industry is pretty traditional. So we are in the manufacturing area or sector where um, people are used to 
have close interaction with the sales counterparts. So like we are talking B2B, this means the sales department is talking to the procurement department of our uh, uh, company and uh, the procurement department of our company with the sales department of others. So it's very traditional, very driven by personal interaction. But what we've seen now, with, especially when COVID hit, is that also the industrial sector is now slowly but steady transitioning into the digital area. This means that our customers are more and more expecting similar processes and workflows they are used to B2C process. Like for example, if you go on Amazon, we can see all the products available. We have choices, we have recommendations, we have reviews. Also when we order something, we have the whole um, chain of where the good right now is from transit into delivery and whatever available at fingertips which is currently not the case for our industry. And they are now more and more expecting those kind of processes. The good thing for us, it's uh, still in the early phases, so we have time to implement and develop those kind of things. But of course, the pressure's on. The minute there is some kind of uh, industry tech company coming with a solution, it's going to disrupt our business significantly. So what we are now, of course, trying to do is trying to not lose the train and jump onto this journey. And this means we need to do a lot of groundwork. So when people talk about, oh, let's use AI or uh, machine learning models to do some kind of business process, I always have to slow them down and say, hey, guys, the organization is not yet ready. Because what we have to do first is have a look at what kind of data is available, what kind of platforms do we have available. Because the beautiful model or the most beautiful model will not help if the data coming in is not clean, is not in high quality, or does not make any sense. And this is right now the biggest challenge for us, working in a very traditional uh, but global company with more than 40 entities worldwide, where we first have to make sure that the data management we are doing is consistent and makes sense. Because when we talk, a very concrete challenge we have at the moment is, we do not have a golden customer record, for example. If you are a digitally native company where everything happened online from the get-go, customer signs up and this record is available in any kind of system. For us, our customers, they're sometimes generated on a piece of paper. And how do we get those customer data then together? And this, those are the biggest challenges we have at the moment that we first streamline and harmonize our data, especially our master data processes so that we are essentially able to apply any kind of digital technology or AI and analytics. Thank you, Andy. Hari, insights from your side? I think I can feel what Andres says, right? Because insurance is also very much a paper-based industry. I mean, all of us here would be consuming some form of insurance, right? We don't expect anything to be real-time. I don't expect my claims to be approved real-time, right? That was the feeling or the expectation as a consumer they had towards the industry a couple of years ago, right? But thanks to COVID, I think it's the biggest digital transformation in the industry, right? Uh, everything had a shutdown, everything had to become digital. Suddenly the entire paper industry has to change, right? So everything goes online. And I think that's why we stepped in and said we should use data at this juncture to become a data-driven company rather than focusing only on automation. Yeah, automation will give us efficiency, but data-driven can give you a lot more things, right? So we started focusing on certain things as what is the business strategy that we want? So we went to different lines of business. We asked them what are the use cases? What is the business strategy that you want to drive towards? So based on those business strategies, we started deriving what is the data strategy has to be. Because for example, some will say, I want claims. Some will say, I want to see how customers purchase, right? Some will say, I want to see sales optimization. Then this strategy kind of tells me what kind of data we need to gather. So it's customer data, it's claims data, it's my sales data. By looking at this data and looking at where are these data available in different pockets of the organization, then we find what are the tools and environments, the ecosystem that we need to build to harness this data. Once we identify how do we harness this data, then we have to get into the mode of you know, building the culture towards it. Because again, in a traditional insurance world where you have a ET of about three days to process a claim, you have to get a culture to say, you know, start looking at data, get value from data, start making decisions looking at the data value, right? So that's a transformation journey that we'd have to go through. And once that happened, and that's where I think the oil starts flowing, right? And then the, I think the last or the most critical part of the entire strategy was to get your board or your C-levels buy-in because they have to buy into the strategy. They have to get to the ground people and say, yes, let's start looking at it. Let's start driving our business meetings with data-driven decisions, right? And that's where the whole engine starts working on. I think that's where we started off. Thank you, Hari. 
So now that we have uh, discussed some of the challenges that you are uh, seeing uh, with the emerging technologies, with, with the possibilities, uh, Akash, any advice you would have for us, uh, uh, for our audience on topics of, let's say, data, data strategy formulation, standard formulation, uh, and uh, things to keep in mind while implementing these? Yeah, sure. So, uh... I think uh, when we are when we are starting early, right? First of all, we need to start early on our data strategy, and we need to start right at the beginning itself. What we have I have observed is that sometimes we create our data strategy, but we forget about the basics of data governance, data quality, how is data being used. You will find terabytes or even petabytes of data which is not being utilized by anyone, which creates a technical debt, and then we spend a year by saying data platform 2.0 and we start cleaning it up. So my advice would be that we need to start early and we need to look at these basic issues which, are, which is going to be a foundation of your data platform is starting from the right data, right data quality, data accessibility, data discovery. These are the foundation. If these are not strong, then we are not able to, we won't be able to create any business impact due to it. Thank you, Akash. Andy, how about you? Uh, well, in our case, uh, similar like for you, Akash, uh, of course, data governance and, and right data quality from the get-go, very important. Um, for my organization, because it is so mature and, 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 and has certain processes already in, engraved and which are tough to break, what we have to ensure is that we as a digital transformation department, that we are enabling the business but not paralyzing. And what I mean by this is, when we, for example, formulate a data strategy, we cannot come up with a data strategy that is completely disrupting any operation so that then we cannot serve our customers anymore or the systems are down, whatever. So our business or our data strategy um, is evolving around building a platform which is on top of our core systems. So this means our operations continue and the platform on top is then consuming data from the operations and the data consuming or the, 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 the consumption of data is based on certain standards. So this is then where the data governance comes in place. Um, what I mean by this is, we do not tell to the business the way how they should structure the operations. They can just continue as they want, but we introduce into each and every system uh, standards. Like for example, we implement master data standards like a customer ID, a product ID, a supplier ID, and for example, a GL ID, because GL accounts are very important, especially for the reporting. Beyond that, we allow our organizations or our companies in the, in, the, in the organization to do whatever they want, as long as they stick to the standards. And what this means is we do then an automated extraction of the various source systems of various kinds. And with those master data identified, we can then implement a company specific translation or extraction logic, but then on the platform, everything is harmonized. And then all the digital services, they start on the platform where we have harmonized data without interrupted uh, core systems. So this is our, for example, our data strategy, which helps us to keep the business running while slowly but steadily transitioning into uh, digital services. Is it the most efficient approach? Of course not. I would love to have the, all the companies on our, uh, in our company uh, are running on, for example, an SAP system. I just buy off the shelf. It is not the case. And transitioning now everybody to SAP or to for HANA and whatever, first of all, it costs tons of money. We cannot afford this, especially if we have small operations. And it will paralyze the business for years. So with our approach, we are essentially able to, yes, have some duplicated effort by implementing data pipelines multiple times, company specific, but create value way faster without having to disrupt the business. I don't think I can much differ with both the gentlemen here, right? I think the principles are all the same from a data strategy perspective. I think only the difference for us or the nuances is we are a highly regulated industry. So with the regulations come, a lot more rules are being built into our core system where how do you do a KYC of a customer? How do you process claims? How do you do underwriting? So those are very tightly coupled rules which are very heavily regulated by different industry controls, right? So in that case, we didn't want to go and touch any of our core systems. So just continuing from my previous topic was once I have the business objectives aligned, so from the business objectives, we extract the data from the source systems into a data platform. So then we kind of decouple this source system compatibilities 
or the issues that we have in the nuances of the source system, right? So once we get the data into a landing zone or a raw layer that we typically call, I think then we do the same thing as what we have said is we need to ensure the data quality is there because it's garbage in, garbage out, right? As traditional office, you know. So if the data quality is not put in, then I think the measure doesn't come out, right? So once we have it in the landing zone, I think the lot of things that we invest is, again, we don't try to get in petabytes of data. Whatever data we get in, we try to make sure that we have quality into those data. And from there, we start building the harmonization layers and then start building it for the respective use cases, right? So that's how we started building the data layer. But just to add on to the data layer is also we started making sure that we have the right tools for the ecosystem, right? Because again, we want to make sure that the consumers know how to use the data. So we want to make sure that we have the right platforms and choose the right technologies. Because again, you don't want to go in and get a lot of new technologies like Spark or anything, and then you'll have to cross train your hundreds of developers that's already existing in the organization. So we looked at technologies and platforms that are more compatible with existing developers, then how do we kind of upscale them from there? So that's how we kind of started integrating that to the data strategy as well. And so how do we leverage you will career paths to the existing developers that's probably doing a reporting service or doing a data warehouse? How do we try and kind of push them ahead into the curve and start looking at them into a data world? So start pushing. We took the business analyst, started converting them into a data analyst. And that's how we started grooming the in-house talents into the next stage. And in that case, you start getting both the business and the tech involved together. And it kind of ha happens to be upscale on both sides. Thank you, Hari. In fact, this is very uh, interesting that all three of you come from different industries uh, and uh, are in different stages of this data journey. And the insights, uh, yeah, the variety that you presented, uh, very, uh, very interesting. Akash, you had mentioned uh, in your introduction that yeah. you've been involved in uh, self-serve analytics, uh, data democratization kind of initiatives. Could you share some insights with us? Yeah, definitely. So what we, the way we built our data platform is that it should be self-sufficient. And the meaning of self-sufficient is a user who knows SQL should be able to get the required insights from the data platform. That means we try to extract all the technology related uh, uh, knowledge and all from the user because if we, if we make our platform too dependent on the knowledge that is required to use it, then our business user will struggle a lot. And that is where starting from the beginning, right from the data ingestion until the use of the data, all of our tools are self-serve. Data ingestion is a one-click solution. After that, once data ingestion is done, data pipeline is another uh, small amount of effort is required only for that. And as soon as the data is available, it is discoverable. And after that, a person just needs to get access, which is again, is something we have made simplified that even a person sitting here who is not having access to laptop can just click and approve the access. Once everything is done, then the user will be immediately able to run SQL queries. So the intent is that as the organizations are becoming lean, we can't invest or rely on a lot of people to give business, business insights, and the user should be able to do it on their own. And as uh, in the last session, we were talking about data literacy, which is again a key enabler for it, because if people do not know about the data, they don't know about SQL. So while we build our data platform in a self-serve manner, we need to work on data literacy for the users so that they can keep on becoming self-serve and, and uh, getting insights become, become easy. And, and just to add on that, like this is one of the key metrics that we are now trying to measure. How much time does it take for a user to get the business insight from a new data source? If it is taking too long, then I think we are failing somewhere. That's how I put it. Thank you, Akash. Uh, Andreas? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just uh, super jealous on Akash because he said like, oh, they, they can give access to a SQL query or whatever. In my organization, people do not actually know that SQL and SQL is the same. Mm -hmm. So for us, the self-service starts on a completely different level. Mm -hmm. So your self-service is right here, like on the data source. And our self-service must be right here. The self-service we are offering right now because the, data, the organization is not yet literate and not technically savvy is we provide dashboards, but those dashboards, they are more like, more like static reports. We have limited possibility for them to change parameters, whatever. Like for example, we completely removed a date selection. 
because the minute you give access to the date selection, they are selecting any kind of random date and interpret it incorrectly. And it doesn't matter how prominent you display what kind of data is selected. So what we implement, for example, just for the sake of simplicity, that whenever a user opens a dashboard or a report, it is always the latest date. They cannot go back in time. They have then time series data, okay, that's the only point, but they cannot change the overarching date. This is just as an example on what kind of self-service level we are talking about and we, we can implement. The good thing though is that with the technology available today, those are just settings, right? So the minute the organization starts getting literate, we can go one level deeper, like, okay, we are now allow for different kind of selections. When this is then finally ingrained in an organization, people know how to use it, you can then go from another level deeper, you offer multiple pages because, oh yeah, you can actually swap pages, right? We are slowly but steadily introducing more and more complexity, but we really start with high level, and there we could already see like the first time when we published those kind of self-service, they were overwhelmed, like, wow, I can now see all the data which previously I had to open five Excel files at the same time and have to swap, and it's already a big win. Like, in the self-service journey, for, as far as I can see, it will take maybe another two, three, four years for us to get to that, that point, but it's okay because different organization, different background, um, but the important thing is start early with self-service so that the organization gets used to it and then don't just flood them with every single possibility. It will not work. Thank you, Andy. Hari? Yeah, I think I'm somewhere in between Andres and Akash in terms of the self-service journey. I think uh, traditionally in any insurance company, right, people are used to reports because you have to do a lot of regulatory reports. So people know how to use reports, how to generate reports. So now we had to just push that a bit and nudge them to go a step ahead, right? Because now that you know how to use data, then how do you push them ahead, right? So then we started looking at tools that are not too technical heavy, right? How do you make it easier for non-technical or business users to start consuming data? So we looked at tools and how do we make sure that, you know, by a feature of drag and drop, they can do certain things. So the first thing we made sure that there is data quality, there is consistency, there is accuracy. So anytime we say that data is available for you, at least these three parameters are always met. So once these three parameters are met, then we should say the data is available for you to start doing your reporting. Then once we've given them the tool, we again bifurcated the group of users into two. One, we call them citizen data scientists who could do a little bit of analysis to data science. And the other, we call them as self-service reporting, right? So we kind of broke them into two people. Then we started a pilot program within the organization. So because they are already used to data, so we started the pilot program because they had an understanding of how data works. So part of the pilot program, we started teaching them how to use the data. Then we started helping them and having a kind of a weekly workshops and we moved it to a monthly workshops, right? That's where the education starts and people start appreciating the value. Once that increased, then we started doing a cross-department collaboration. We started showing it to the other departments, you know, how department E O B is leveraging it. How are they getting business efficiency in it? How is operational efficiency coming in? That's where the other departments, part of the business strategy started and said, okay, next quarter or the next half yearly, we also want to start doing. I think that's the journey we are on. Yes, as Andrew says, it's another couple of years down the road, but at least we've started on the process. Very interesting to see the different journeys. Huh? Hari, uh, in an earlier reply uh, or in an uh, earlier point, you mentioned about technology stack selection uh, and how it is important. It plays a very important role in this journey. Uh, can you elaborate on this, please, for our audience? Yep. I think uh, in income, we have three generations of data technologies. Uh, Ten years back, we started with reporting servers. Five years back, we started with the data warehouse, typical SQL data servers. Uh, two years back, we started with Cloud Aura data lakes, and then COVID hit us. We're running for semiconductor chips and hardware, right? So we're we forced to go into cloud. I think that's where the data journey started off. But during this journey, we see a lot of things that we could, as first hand, get to learn, right? I think the first thing that we understood is, first we need to understand the business priorities. What do they want to do in six months, 12 months, 24 months? Because we build a spaceship and they, if they're not going to use it, the whole spaceship is going to be wasted. So we start prioritizing the business use cases based on six, 12, 24 months. Then we build a data platform accordingly to those needs. So when we start looking at it, we looked at two things, right? We assess the existing uh, infrastructure that we have. Is there something that we can scale from the existing infrastructure? If we cannot scale, then what is the next easily available option to us, right? So that's one we do. Then we looked in terms of the technology platforms. 
uh, to be grown by all the fancy window shoppings. I mean, today, I think Milan earlier said there is Data Lake, Lake House, Delta Lake, Apache, and whatnot, and right? Every other day, there's another new thing that comes up. So we didn't want to go into a lot of window shopping. We want to be close to where our heart is. We looked at what skill sets our team has, what capability that as an organization we have built over the years, and we looked at technologies that's closer to it and mature enough. Since we are regulated, again, we didn't, couldn't go much into open source, but we went into open source, which had at least some kind of a premium support or third party support. So we looked at those kind of stacks, identified those stacks, and then we went on. Again, to start off, we went with the ETL layer. We took the, the tools that we want to pick up. Then we went into data quality, data governance, because once the data is in, we want to make sure it is secure enough. So those are the other two platforms we chose. Once this data security is put in place, then we looked at the visualization layer. What is the right tools to connect to these platforms? Once the visualization layer is done, then we looked at the data science platforms. Again, do we go into data, hardcore data science where we give all Apache notebooks or anything else there, or do we go into a citizen data robot kind of a style? So we start evaluating both the options and we start experimenting in pockets of size. And once this is done, then we started trying to see how do we scale this to the next step. So once we start building in pilots, then we start looking at the scale journey. That's where we are. Thank you, Hari. Andy, how are you approaching uh, the tech stack, uh, tech stack selection within your organization? So for us, we had like uh, a lot of options to choose, but uh, we were steered in a certain direction. What I mean by this is our whole organization is running, for example, on Microsoft's Office stack and we just migrate to our Office 365 on Azure. So it was a natural choice to then also use as cloud provider Azure, and our whole data platform is built on top of that platform. We specifically opted for a cloud solution because of the ease of use for the quick deployment, plus also the potential to quickly scrape it and stuff somewhere else. Because if you buy all the server, you have the working capital at hand and you have to work with this one. Um, this was the, the first kind of uh, area we tapped into that, yeah, it must be cloud, it must be Azure. But on top of that, the choice is pretty much free. Uh, the other important thing in our technology stack was that we are not relying on proprietary or vendor-based solutions. Like we specifically opted against solutions like HubSpot for CRM or SAP for or BW for data warehouse. We built mainly on open source or on uh, Microsoft SQL Server databases, and then uh, using like the, the classical MERN stacks uh, and stuff like this, just what is currently really like, um, where also the, the, the people are available in the market so that you can essentially build those, um, which also means that we specifically uh, hired and built up a software engineering department in our company. So we are not outsourcing the software development to externals because what we said is our software that we're currently developing for the digital transformation is going to be core to our business and everything what is core we need to internalize. So that's why we are ramping up a software development team which is then building those solutions custom which are then tailor-made to our organization always with the goal of having integration. So it doesn't help us to have a nice data platform but data is still manually extracted or manually feed somewhere in. So the integration part is very important. And that's why we opted for a custom build solution with an internal development team based on open source to have those capabilities at hand all the time. Thank you, Andy. Very interesting. Huh? Akash? Uh, I think technolo technology or tech stack is just a medium to achieve our goal. So we use variety of tools uh, uh, starting from our platform is in Kubernetes, we use BigQuery, and there are many programming languages that we are using. But I believe the key part is how fast you can switch from one technology to another is, is going to play an important role. Because with so many options available and technology is changing so fast that we might be using a tool A at the moment, but after uh, six months we realize tool B is better. Now if it takes one year again to for me to switch from tool B to tool A, then I'm not able to leverage the powers of technology. So that's where I think success lies uh, in a, to create a evolving data platform. Uh, yeah, that's how I put it. Thank you. This is really exciting, this uh, conversation that we are having. We started from, yeah, what are the challenges, yeah, how we should go about 
strategy formulation, uh, yeah, uh, implementation, uh, data self-serving. We now also discussed about uh, tech stack selection. Unfortunately, we are beginning to run out of time. Yes. Uh, so this is where maybe uh, you can help us uh, uh, close by any last piece of advice that you would give to our audience here, starting with you. Yeah. Uh, sh so I, I, I would just repeat what I said earlier, right? Start early and start right at the beginning. Uh, it's high time that every, organi or every organization starts leveraging the power of data. And I won't shy away from saying that it would be great if, great if we start leveraging a bit of AI also, because it's going to come into picture sooner or later. If we start doing it now, it's going to uh, increase the pace at which we are working at the moment. Thank you. From my point of view, what is very important in the digital transformation journey and in the implementation of big data analytics and AI is not to get distracted by all the news that are published every single day. Like, my LinkedIn feed, I'm, I'm close to just shut it down because like, oh, a new model here, a new model there. And it always gives you the impression that you're running this hamster wheel and you're not getting anywhere because if you keep on changing every techno the technology every single day, there will be no business outcome at all. So this one is, I think, very important is that you focus on one task using the right data quality, the right technology for that task, and independent on if there's now a new shiny or sexy solution available, implement first before you evaluate the change. However, and this is going to be the challenge, always keep an eye and an ear open on any kind of new disruptive technology, because what can happen really one day, uh, one day after the next one is that there is a technology available which is completely making what you're currently working on obsolete. And one of those technologies was, for example, for us, ChatGPT. Because if I look at ChatGPT, uh, when this came out, I was like, okay, the whole robotics process automation that we were implementing, I can now throw it into the trash bin. Because I can just ask ChatGPT to take this document and extract the data for me. So those kind of extreme examples can happen, but this is going to be a challenge, like trying to stay focused uh, while uh, making sure that new technologies are not getting neglected. Thank you, Andy. Hari? Yeah. I mean, it's been a great, insightful journey, right? I think it's two different industries, two different viewpoints. I think the goal is the same. Uh, similarly, I would say, right, I think they've covered most points, but I would just like to add two more points to it, right? One is get the foundation right, uh, especially in terms of your data quality, getting your business glossary and your data model right, right? Because if that part goes wrong, whatever you try to build on top of any use cases, AI, data science, everything else is wrong. Because if there is no trust and fairness in your models, and they depend on the correct, correct and variety of data that's available for them, then the model outputs are gonna be wrong. Similar to your dashboards, right? If the data sources are wrong, your dashboards are gonna produce you inaccurate results. So make sure that part of it is done. Make sure you have a data governance framework that controls the entire data ecosystem in terms of access control, in terms of security, who can access, who can download. Because you're talking about self-service, because when you give access to everybody to the data, you also need to ensure how do you secure the data. Because there's a lot of things that we hear about cyber crimes, misuse of data, so we wanna ensure that the data you provide, the access you provide is also ensured and secured, right? And similarly, when you're going on into the AI world, there's a lot of AI ethics. I think the previous speakers have all spoken about it. Uh, again, both Singapore government has published a lot of papers on AI ethics. So before you get onto it, just at least make sure you have a governance model for your, any models that you publish, and make sure you, that's being adhered to and followed. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Hari, and Andy, and Akash for such a fantastic discussion. Huh? Thanks, Hari. Thanks, Milind. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big hand, of course, to our moderator, Milan, and together with the site as well, especially with this local hip hop digital, wonderful insights, right? Also, ladies and gentlemen, and this